Yo, what's happening guys? Welcome to a brand new edition of Rave Diaries and Tower Block Tales with yours truly, Uncle Doug's in the building. Um, as always, before we go anywhere, I just want to thank everyone for uh, liking, commenting and especially subscribing to the channel. Thank you so much guys. Um, glad you're all enjoying it when I'm out and about. I'm getting loads and loads of lovely comments when I'm out and about. So thank you to all of you guys and all the comments underneath especially the Rave diary stuff where we're all kind of sharing stories and memories uh, and truths, you know what I mean? Because sometimes I'm saying something that I don't really know much about and someone else will come underneath and say, yeah, Doug, it was this, that and the other. I was there. These were my friends that did this certain thing, blah, blah, blah. And we're getting the real truths underneath in the comments. So when you're watching these videos, if you're going back through them at any point, make sure you read the comments underneath because there's loads of additions to all of the stories that I'm telling along the way. So yeah, big up you lot. Uh, right, today's uh, episode, uh, I wanted to do an episode on dub plate culture, um, truthfully I was never the biggest dub plate DJ, I mean even now I'm a classics DJ, I guess in a way, even though I didn't know it years ago, I was a bit of a classics DJ all my life, I was never really that guy that had all the dubs, all the newest tunes, um, there was a time in my life when I wanted them all but I couldn't get them. Uh, and then when I got to a point in my life where I could get any track that I wanted, I kind of was happy with who I was and what I was doing. So um, I was never really a big dub plate hunter as such. Um, I didn't have the links. I didn't have the money. Um, I, I didn't have the know-how for a long time. I just thought that was a world that was for them lot and not for us lot, as in ravers, bedroom DJs. But obviously um, that wasn't the case. But... Um, you know, I like to be honest, I was kind of naive going into this journey and it took me a long time to, to get to places where other people got much quicker than me because of my naivety, I guess, uh, and I was pretty shy and I didn't like to push my way to the front and, and ask too many questions. I just always thought like, I'll get there in the end. Thank God I did. But um, yeah, would I advise everyone to do it that way? Probably not. Push yourself to the front, make yourself be heard. Anyway, um, I actually sold all my record collection in 2019. Um, so I haven't got any records left or dub plates or anything. But when I sold my records, um, there was a few tunes that didn't belong to me that I kept. And one of them being this one here. So we're going to talk about dub plate culture. When you talk about dub plates, this, this track here, yeah. Before I even show you what it is, I'm going to big up DJ SL, yeah. See DJ SL, Call FM. This is his dub plate, all right, before we go anywhere. Um, he he lent this to me a few years ago to record in, and I keep threatening to give it back to you, yes, but I haven't yet, but it's here, as you can see, and, and I promise you, mate, I've looked after it. Um, but I wanted to, to show you this one here, because this track, especially, when you talk about dub plate culture and what it represents, I would put this, for me personally, and I know for a lot of junglists, and especially the Call FM crew, you'd put this at the top of your wants list, uh, list for a dub plate. So this dub plate here, yeah, can you see that? The matrix on that side, chill out on that side. I'm a bit chill out, chill out, I'm a bit chill out. You know that tune now? Music House dub plate cut. Um, let me put this back in here before we go anywhere. So I don't want Sean to be watching this and he's like, Doug, you're not even looking after my reading properly. Anyway, right. So that is a dub plate. So firstly, what is a dub plate for them what don't know? So a dub plate is an acetate record. It's a one-off cut. So if you want a, if you want a vinyl, you can't just cut one vinyl because nobody can afford to just press one vinyl. So um, a way around that is to make a one-off record that is basically a piece of metal with a lacquer spray over the top of it. And then a record will be cut from a lathe. So rather than pressed like a record press, these tunes are cut from a lathe. So the lathe will go around and the dub, the dub guy who's cutting your dub, very clever men, like a science to them, they'll work out how to get the best sound out of your tune, cut you the one off, and you walk out of there with this beautiful piece of really quite heavy, not flimsy like a record. Still smells wicked now. The tune's 30 years old, it still smells. Everyone who knows about dub plates is smiling now. They've got a certain smell about them, they're beautiful. So, yeah, you walk out of the dub house with a one-off cut. Now, why would you want a one-off cut? It may be that it's a track with your name in, so why would you press 500 white labels of a track with your name in it? Because no one's going to buy that. 
It may be that it's just a brand new track that needs road testing. So it may be a track you've made yourself or it may be a track that somebody else has made that they've given to you back in the old days. It would have been on a DAT tape uh, as time went on that changed. But back in the day, you got given a DAT and the DAT would have one track on it or five tracks on it or whatever. You would take that to the cutting house. They would put it in their DAT machine. The DAT machine would play through and they would cut it on the lathe and you would get your dub plate. So yeah, all the different reasons you would want a one-off press were catered for at the dub cutting place. Music House, pound for pound, was probably the most famous in our scene. Um, there was other cutting houses, you know, all over London, all over the country. But we, we're talking about Jungle, you know, with this track here, especially that era. Um, Music House was was the gaff to go to, and if you went to Music House, you would literally bump into the who's who of. You know, not just jungle drum and bass, but you get reggae man and garage man and all that. But from our world, you would see the who's who. Like literally, the triple A list guys would be down there cutting, and anyone who wasn't a triple A list guy had to wait four hundred years to get served. And you could get to the front of the queue, and then before you knew it, you could end up at the back of the queue again because a lot of the triple A list guys had turned up, and they just didn't queue, and they didn't. You know, they was cutting hundreds and hundreds of pounds worth of dubs every week. Mugs like us would go down with like one track on that once every 10 years and be like, yeah, I want to get this. So obviously they were catering for more. That was how it was. It was like being in a record shop, but worse. When you used to get test presses handed over your head like that in a record shop, look round and someone would be taking that and you'd ask for it and you couldn't have it. It was a bit like that at the dub place, but worse. You could queue up all day and get nowhere. But much like record shop culture, it was part of the fun. Weirdly, just seeing the people that we looked up to there was a lot of deals made at, at the at the dub house. There was a lot, not bad drug deals. I mean, like deals between you, like you could bump into someone down there and end up cutting their track because you met them now. A track that you would never have got your hands on otherwise. People that had labels were signing tracks to their labels down there because guys were turning up with tunes that they'd made that no one had ever heard before. It would get heard at the dub house. People would want to cut it. Someone might hear that and think I'd sign that to my label. So it was a really, really important place in terms of that. But actual dub plate culture, um, coming into it how I did, which I guess if you watch all of these videos, you're kind of piecing together my journey for it. I didn't come through no reggae kind of background. I came into this scene in 1991 with no knowledge of anything. I didn't know. I didn't even know what a mix was, let alone a dub plate. I had to learn all these things. But dub plate culture, uh, I'm not saying that dubs didn't get cut in the early 90s. I'm assuming they probably did. But um, really, the emergence of jungle music really, really pushed dub plate culture as a thing. It became a thing, like a, a badge, you know what I mean? Like a badge of pride, like honour. If you had the big dub that no one else had, that was you, mate. That set you aside from everyone else. And then people started getting names cut into the dubs and stuff like that as well. Um, Mickey Finn, for instance, one of them that you remember from the Jungle Sound Clash. Mickey Finn, a DJ, he gonna spin those two. They're calling all the people dub, and all of them were getting them around that time. But just pre prior to that, um, people like me were picking up on pirate radio talking about dub plates. That's why pirate radio is so important in all of this story because it's not just the music, it's not just the advert sending you to raves, it's things like explaining to you without even meaning to, it wasn't like they did lessons in dub plate culture, but we were all so immersed as listeners and fans, we picked up on everything. So when you started hearing the word dub plate, you went, what's a dub plate? You find out what a dub plate is. Then you start hearing that DJs are playing tracks that no one else has got, long before anyone else can get them, and the MC's calling it dub plate, this one a dub plate press, this one dub plate pressure, whatever. That made it even more special. You had a, a released record, you had a white label promo, you had a test press, but before that, you had a dub plate. That was the like the the seed. You know what I mean? Some of these dubs, like this tune here, chill out. It never ever come out. The only way you can ever have this is if you've got a dub plate. I mean, now we've got MP3s and all that. People rip them and send them around. But this never come out on a vinyl. So that's what I'm saying about dub plates were so important at that time because some things that we love never even made it to the record shop for people like me to buy. Um, so yeah, very, very, very important. And as hardcore progressed the, uh, progressed the jungle, definitely dub plate culture became as big a deal as record culture in the eyes of the, the, the DJs, in the eyes of the bedroom DJs, 
And also in the eyes of the listeners and the ravers and the consumers of the music, it become a thing. Like it was more than just the acetate record. It was part of the culture. It was like the clothes that we wore. It was like the way that we spoke, the way that we moved in life. Dub plate was a part of that. So um, obviously as time went by, things evolved and dub plates like vinyl um, became less and less because they, they were quite inexpensive. I mean, something like this, I think, if I remember correctly, would have cost you about 25, 30 quid around about that time now. I think, I stand to be corrected, maybe it was a bit cheap, but I think that was about 25, 30 pound. So you're paying 30 quid for two tracks. Um, you think if you've got 10 tracks, you want to cut that week. You know, it soon starts adding up, you're doing that every week. You're talking five, six, seven, eight hundred pound. The big guys were, were paying out probably more. They were probably getting them cheaper, but they were cutting a lot more. So it becomes quite an expensive habit. Once CDs were invented, and people started using the first sort of CD uh, decks, before they were decks even, they were little rubbish. But anyway, when the CD culture first come around, it meant that people could get these sort of things sent to them, put them on a CD, pay nothing. So it kind of, it kind of makes sense in a financial way, but in a cultural way, um, much like record shops closing over the years for CDs as well, it didn't help in a cultural way. It separated us as people. We was now on computers talking instead of in people uh, dealing with each other face to face. But that's how it goes. That's technology. I mean, you know, would I change it? Probably not, to be honest, because that is how it goes. But I am so glad that I was, you know, a, a small part of this whole record shop dub play culture when I was, because um, it was so so important and and it was exciting when you could. It's funny because. You think, if you can't get a track, don't, listen, it's annoying. When you, I don't care now because things are different, but when I was younger and I wanted to be the guy and I wanted these tracks, it bothered me. When I couldn't get a track, it bothered me. But what it done was it kept you hungry. When everything weren't just at your fingertips, it kept you really hungry. You was always out looking. Every record shop you went to, you was looking for that one that your mates didn't have, that you could play on the radio and everyone would be like, bro, that tune's bad. I can't get my hands on that, but you've got, you know, it was that. It was competitive. Even though we was all on the same team, when it comes to, like, the station, we was all like that. But on the station, we're all trying to outdo each other. It's a competitive, like, you know, it's a competitive industry. It's almost like a sport, you know what I mean? You want to be the best. You're doing a back-to-back, -back, but really, you're clashing a little bit. Any DJ that says they don't want to be better than the other DJ, he's lying. Or they're, they're wrong, do you know what I mean? Anytime you do a back-to-back, -back, even if it's with your best friend... Slightly is a little bit of clashing now. And having dub plates, that was a way to elevate you above everyone. And if you had the links and you had the money, you could make your set much better than everyone else's by playing the tracks that the big DJs had at that time, that they were popping in the rows or on Call FM or whatever. Um, but the sad thing is, like I say, there is a few tunes that didn't make it out onto a general release, like this track here, The, the Matrix, Chill Out. Um, but again, almost, it's almost like a good thing. You know what I mean? When everything's so easy to get, it makes it boring, doesn't it? When things are like a holy grail. When, when, when I went to SL's house, yeah, when I got to know SL, I wanted to play this. I think it was the first Ribena that we did, when it was called Ribena, I think. And I really wanted to play this track. And there was only, Jinx had this. I think Ron might have had a copy. Pressure X had a copy. SL had a copy. I think Brocky had a copy. Like, there was a handful of DJs that had this track here. And I got to know SL. And I rang him up and said to him, um, would you mind if I come around and recorded this thing? And I went to his gaff. He gave me the dub plate and said, bring it back. Don't worry when you're ready. Obviously, it didn't mean 300 years later. Um, and I have seen him a million times since. And I always say to him, bro, I've got that tuning door. So here it is, mate. No, it does exist. And I promise you, I promise you, I promise you it's coming back to you. But um, yeah, just just that holy growl of these kind of tracks makes them so special. Even now when I play this in the dance, it gets such a good response because it ain't an original nutter, it ain't incredible, it ain't chopper. Do you know what I mean? You don't hear them all the time. So even though they were hard to get and they'd done our heads in as DJs back then, and some people still haven't even got these tracks, even though they're available di digitally, they're not common available digitally. They're available around a few people digitally that don't like to let music out. 
So even 30 years later, these tracks are still Holy Grail. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Because like I say, everything there, you can type it into a search thing, find it, download it, have it on your stick and play it that weekend. I bet you can't with this. And there's a lot of tunes that are like this. There's tracks that I can't even still get now in the world that I live in. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Big up dub plate culture. Because like I say, it wasn't a huge thing that I was involved in. I'm never going to pretend I was damn music ass every week. But a the man they've given it the big one. I wasn't. I really, really wasn't. But dub plate culture inspired me, even from a distance, to to want to be better. To want to have the tracks to want to try and get to the point where I could have the Matrix chill out myself, you know what I mean? So yeah, I felt dub plate culture definitely deserved an episode on Rave Divers and Tower Block Tales, albeit mostly I'm telling it from a spectator view, if I'm totally honest, because I didn't really cut dubs. I didn't cut dubs till the, after this era. My first dub plate was 96, I think, even. I didn't have the links and the money, like I say, to really go and do that, them things there. I just... Yeah, it wasn't as easy as it probably, I It wasn't. As, I didn't think it was as easy as what it was. I thought you had to be right in the mix and all that. And when I look back, I was, I was so silly and naive. Even when I was on pirate radio, I wasn't really getting down there to do that. I was getting around all the record shops and trying to claim the test presses and the promos. But um, yeah, that's my story. Everyone's is different, but dub play culture, yeah. Very, very important in evolution of jungle drum and bass music especially. Garage, you know, all the other all the other kind of scenes that kind of are around that. They had dub plates, but I would say dub plate culture was a huge thing in jungle drum and bass, especially over the top of all of the other musics, I guess, outside of reggae where they originate from. Um, so yeah, another episode done. Shout out to everybody that's been locked in today. Uh, I'm sure you've like, got loads of stories about dub plates. Everybody had dub plates at some point in their life, I'm sure. Um, feel free to comment underneath. Tell me about your local dub cutting place, who worked there, what you had cut now. You know, any stories of Music House, of course, RIP Chris. Shout out to all the gang that used to get down to Music House. So important in the, in the evolution of, uh, of music. You know what I mean? Not just our music, of music. Full stop, because anyone who needed a dub car... A lot of time they went to Music House and, and if they didn't, they went to one of the other. So feel free to comment on any of your dub play stories underneath. I'd love to hear them. Uh, but for now, thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing, liking and commenting. Rave Diaries and Tower Block Tales. We are out of here until the next episode. Yeah, peace.